This is a Rook Media series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 3. Hi there, and welcome to the Contemporary History of Iran, a series from Rook Media. This is part three, Farah Diba and the Rise of Iranian Art. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Our aim with this series is to explore the events, personalities, and issues that have shaped modern Iran. We want to do this as much as possible through a non-traditional lens, through snapshots of change and using alternative voices or angles. This series is mostly in English and will feature a new episode posted every Thursday across our Rook Media platforms. We will post subtitled excerpts with Farsi Zirnavis on our YouTube and Instagram sites. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms and we invite you to check out parts one and two of this series that are already posted. The Contemporary History of Iran is brought to you in part by Yazdani Law Group. YLG is one of the largest Iranian-Canadian immigration law firms. Their mission, rooted in the leadership of founder Afshin Yazdani, is built on continuously striving to innovate and introduce new immigration pathways for their clients. Mr. Yazdani began his career as a lawyer and law professor in Iran, and his company has now made it their goal to provide the best, simplest, least risky, and most inexpensive way to immigrate to Canada. YLG has an impressive track record, hundreds of applications from Iran successfully processed every year. They are at YLGPC on Instagram. That is Yazdani Law Group. All right, let's get started. Here now is the contemporary history of Iran, part three. Well, when we consider the contemporary history of Iran, it is, of course, impossible to not talk about the Pahlavi dynasty. And we usually focus on the last Shah of Iran, or his father. But in some cases, it was the Shah's wife, Queen Farah, who was the significant figure who had a tremendous impact on Iran and culture in the country. So how much did Farah Diba shape the trajectory of arts and culture for Iran in the mid-20th century? And specifically, what was her impact and influence in bringing art, culture, and museums to Iran in the 1960s and 70s? Well, my guest today is well-placed to consider such questions. She is an Iranian-American independent scholar, art advisor, and curator who was the first woman museum director in Iran. Dr. Leila Sudavar Diba began her career as art advisor to the private secretariat of Farah Pahlavi, the former empress of Iran. She was the director and chief curator of the Negaristan Museum of 18th and 19th century Iranian art from its inception in 1975 until 1978. After moving to the United States in 1979, Leila Diba acted as advisor to museums, corporations, and foundations for and in Iran. Over the span of her career, Dr. Leila Diba has curated and co-curated a number of exhibitions, among them the groundbreaking Royal Persian Paintings, the Qajar Epoch at the Brooklyn Museum in 1999, and the first major international exhibition on 18th and 19th century Persian art and culture at the Asia Society Museum in New York in 2013. Dr. Diba has written and lectured extensively on Persian painting. She's also a trustee of the Encyclopedia Ironica and Sudavar Memorial Foundations and a member of the Academic Advisory Committee of the Iran Heritage Foundation, a member of the Visiting Committee of the Islamic Department of the Metropolitan Museum, and a member of the Collections Committee of the Harvard Art Museum's Department of Islamic and Later Asian Art 
And right now, Dr. Leila Diba joins me from New York City. Hello. Hello, Gian. Nice to speak with you from New York to Toronto. Nice to speak with you, too. Thank you so much for doing this. And as I say, I'm excited to have this conversation with you because you're so well-placed to have it. L- let me start in a macro sense, a broad sort of question. We naturally think of Iran, I suppose, as an artistic place based on gorgeous mosaics or calligraphy or poems or color-rich carpets. But before the intervention of Fadadiba, what was Iran's place in the world when it came to 19th and, and 20th century paintings and modern art? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, it's uh, actually uh, very, very to the point of our discussion today about Her Majesty's role in uh, changing, really, the image of Iran uh, and its culture. In terms of 18th and 19th century Persian art, it was really considered as tourist art and had been collected abroad by diplomats and travelers to Iran as a curiosity, uh, more than really serious artwork. And it was relegated in the museums where it was held in Russia and France and England, usually to the basement or to storage. So it didn't have much of a reputation. But it was in 1969, I believe, when uh, a major collection of uh, Qajar painting that had been formed by one of these diplomats, um, two of them actually, the Amory uh, brothers, came on the market. And through the um, Shabanu's intervention, it was purchased for Iran. And after traveling abroad in a number of cities, it was returned, repatriated, and expressly uh, for being exhibited in a museum that would be devoted to this period and this art. What about um, 20th century art? I mean, did it, if, if you were an Iranian artist before this period, say in the, before the late 60s and the 70s, uh, and the yeah. intervention, as I say, of Farah Diba, um, what would your art be worth in, in terms of the, the, the eyes of the global market? Um, well, uh, Iranian modern art, that is post-war art, was really relatively unknown and undervalued outside of Iran before, say, really the late 60s and 70s. Um, some Iranian artists had traveled to France and other and Italy particularly and received training there. And beginning uh, in the 60s, Iranian artists began to participate in international biennales, such as Venice especially, largely through the uh, intervention of Marco Grigorian, who was a one of the most uh, cosmopolitan and celebrated artists. So I think the reputation of Iranian art took a big jump during the reign of the Shabanu. Um, But in terms of uh, financial value, uh, it was way behind uh, equivalent paintings of the same era in Europe and America. It's funny, as a kid who grew up in the West, I think of great or important historic works of art as just existing in museums. I, I, I don't <laughs> I don't consider what would happen where this art would be if there wasn't museums, you know? So so where yeah. were the kinds of pieces that you would end up hosting in the Negaristan Museum or for that matter the Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art? Uh, where would they be before then? Yes, well that that's two very different questions. As I said, Kajar art had been collected in Western museums, quote unquote, um, and donated to uh, you know to those institutions by the people who had brought it back from Iran. But modern and Iranian art was nowhere to be seen outside of Iran because the only place that it had been exhibited, even in the sixties, was in biennales, and after that it disappeared. So there was no, really no presence. I think it was when the Museum of Contemporary Art opened in 1977. That gave a tremendous visibility because it was not only for European and American uh, modern and contemporary, but for Iranian contemporary. So, um, you know, all, all levels of Iranian art, I think, were raised by 
um, the uh, creation of these uh, numerous museums, of which the Negarstan, which was 18th and 19th century art, was the first one to be opened, and that was in 1975. And if you think about it, it's really only in three years that all yeah. these museums yeah. were created. So there were over over seven museums were directly created under her patronage in those three four years. When you talk about the the Qajar art being housed in some of those cases uh, in in Western museums, so I- inside Iran up until the yeah. Negaristan, where would yeah. would any would, would there be a place to find this stuff at least in an in, in an aggregated way or? Uh, yeah, no, there was there was one great palace museum which was the Golestan Palace and um, that was where you would find um, the uh, manuscripts, tile work, um, the paintings and photography of the Qajar era but very little was on display and there was practically no art of the early to mid 19th century and, and that's what was really important because the Negaristan, the core collection that was acquired from the Amrys, focused mainly on the first half of the 19th century, um, which, you know, I think, you know, was a very important era for Qajar art. So the two complemented each other once uh, the Negaristan was opened. When did Queen Farah first start taking a personal role in wanting to build the arts and culture infrastructure in Iran? Well, I'm afraid you'd have to ask a historian. Um, I can only tell you from my experience by 1973, when I first met her, um, the plans for the museums were well advanced. And there was already, in her mind, a very... Uh, broad vision of what she hoped to accomplish with the creations of these museums and cultural centers. But she she had started the Shiraz Arts Festival already, right? That's right. So probably the beginnings of this much more expanded uh, uh, cultural scene for Iran must have begun in the late 60s, which was when the Shiraz Festival uh, began. By the way, I don't know where you are in New York, but apparently it's a crime scene. There's a there's sirens going off. <laughs> Although I, yes. guess, I guess that's New York to a certain extent. Yes, uh, uh, that's the background. I'm sorry, I had to leave the windows open, but that way you have a lot of New York flavor. It's, it's yes, you're you're effects. keeping it very alive. Yes, uh, yes, yes. So let's get into this story, your story, because it's just fascinating to me. You're you're this young American bo- born in New York with some Iranian background, of course, half Iranian, and you and you had visited Iran a few times. But what what did you first think when you were summoned to meet uh, with Queen Farah in the summer of 1973? Well, uh, as you say, I was a young Iranian-American, and I was meeting my future employer and also the the queen of the country I'd come home to serve. So I'm sure I was a bit intimidated, but what I remember very well is how the Shabanu put me at my ease immediately and with her graciousness and modesty and intelligence um, just joined me in a conversation. It was a conversation between two people. And I remember, I realized what an honor it was going to be to work for her and help her realize this vision, um, you know, even what small part I could play. So uh, I would say I was intimidated, but, uh, you know, just delighted and honored to be speaking with her. What do you think she liked about you? Uh, (laughs) Um, It's funny, I was thinking about this audience, but I think it was actually also an interview, Xi'an, because we had not met face-to-face, and she was entrusting this unknown with uh, her precious collection of Qajar art. I mean, I wasn't seeing that far forward, but she was, you know, because I was hired really to, to work in Her Majesty's private secretariat, which was the nucleus of all the planning and execution of the museum. But you're a kid at the oh. time. I mean, you're not some oh. long-in-the-tooth uh, museum director that's, you know, I mean, the, the, it says something about her, I think, that yes. she would pick you, you know? Yes. It, uh, it's very interesting. 
Well, I was only one of a group of cots. We were between like five and ten. Um, I, uh, young, youngish people um, who had received training abroad and who were trying to bring professionalism or modernity, if you like, to the museum system. And I think she really had a vision for the future and she wanted uh, to have young people involved. So as she looked at me, she would have seen a, a young person who um, shared her her vision uh, for uh, this uh, future of Iran and who had a training, recent training in um, the presentation and education and conservation, all the modern museum methods that were needed. So I hope she saw someone that she saw was qualified and um, also a woman, and as you say, very young. Uh, even today, there are not many young women who are uh, museum directors. So I think it was a moment in time uh, that coincided with a whole generation of younger Iranians and uh, in the arts. And thankfully, we, we could be of use to the Shabanu and her plans for the country. You obviously took the gig. <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> I did. Uh, and and I, I wonder what you made of her um, personally at the time. You know, it, 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 again, from uh, the perspective of someone who's, you know, I've I've used to grow up, grown up, always knowing that there was this, you know, Queen Fada, and 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 she's always been this um, important regal, you know, uh, older figure. You know, I, I mean, when I actually think about it and do the math and go. By the early seventies, she's just in her early thirties. I mean, she's a she's a young woman taking on this role. Besides being the queen, I mean, of sort of saying, "I'm going to try to uh, reshape the way you know Iran is seen artistically or culturally." Uh, tell me what you made of her personally in that in that moment in that first meeting. Of course, you'd get to know her after that. Well, you know, there's a famous movie with Tom Cruise and and Renee Zellweger, in which she says, you had me at hello. Yes. You remember that line? Of course. <laughs> well, that applies to me. <laughs> so I was, I was uh, immensely impressed, as I said, with her modesty, her, her graciousness, her simplicity, and kindness, really. Uh, she was not intimidating at all, and she was very open. You know, to have a conversation with a young 25-year-old uh, is pretty rare uh, among the Iranians of another generation. But as you say, she was. there was not that much of a difference in ages between us. And of course, I think there was a certain uh, level of comfort because I was married to her second cousin. So I think we both felt a little comfortable in that it was family. You know, we were talking to family. Give me your perspective as somebody who's now worked in this field for decades. What what did building and opening museums mean to Iran at the time? Well, for me, um, it was a very important statement about joining the world, about becoming a first world country, and about Iran's equal right to a place in the world of culture, uh, as much as uh, any European country, uh, what we describe as the center and the periphery uh, in terms of culture. I saw Iran becoming a center of culture and art through the creation of these museums. And I think another thing that was important to me is that uh, we all know um, there are still today colonialist uh, and orientalist attitudes towards Iranians that can be demeaning sure. and um, disrespectful. And I felt uh, that the museum culture was part of this. So it was this idea, oh, well, Iranians could never build a modern museum or Iranians could never understand uh, contemporary Western art. Um, I think that we all had shared this uh, vision of, of wanting to prove them wrong, <laughs> in a sense. And, and the importance, and I think the, the logic of that vision, is that these museums, except for mine, at which, as I said, unfortunately, the collections were removed, um, the other museums uh, have, have had a tremendous success in the last 40 years, and they're 
primarily responsible for a lot of the tourism and the income that Iran gets today from international as well as local tourism. So I think um, this was an important step for Iran to be viewed as equal to all the other developed countries in the world. When it comes to, as you just called it, your museum, the, the Negaristan, uh, it, it, it's the first of the, of the ones that were built in that period to open, as you say, and it's 1975. You, you get the job in 73, so there's this two-year period there where uh, you're obviously involved in curating and collecting the pieces that would end up filling the Negaristan Museum. What was that process like? How, how taxing was it to try and find and put all of this stuff in one place? Well, um, I, I must emphasize that I was not the one who purchased the artworks uh, until much later when I was um, just the last year. So when I went back to Iran, I was a very junior member of a team um, that already existed in Her Majesty's private secretariat. Uh, of the, the, the head of the secretariat was Karim Pasha Badri. And then uh, the art advisors, Yahya Zoka and Mohsen Furuki. And these were the gentlemen who really helped the Shabanu to put the collection together. Um, And it continued when I was there, but I was really a junior member of the group. And so the first year when I was in Her Majesty's Secretariat, I worked on various projects, uncreating art, uh, creating seminars, beginning with research, and the second year we barreled forward with um, the head of uh, our section of the secretariat, it was a gentleman called Firuz Shirvan Lu, and so essentially we were always a team, and um, as a team uh, I was responsible with Firuz for all the events pertaining to the opening, meaning uh, some of the installations, the publications, the printings, the poster, Uh, and the events. Um, So uh, all of these were transpired in the first six months, uh, in six months before we actually opened the museum. And uh, for the museum opening, uh, because Firuz was very knowledgeable about publishing and printing, we brought out a Persian translation publication of important articles on Safavid and Qajar art, reprinted others, and produced a lot of visual materials uh, from slides to brochures. Uh, There was an incredible video film that was done uh, by a a Czech architect called Professor Fritsch. And all of these materials, actually, Gian, um, stayed with me. I brought them with me when I left Iran uh, in 1978. And in the last year or two, I began researching the history of my museum, quote unquote. And thanks to all these uh, materials, uh, visual materials and printed materials, I think I can evoke now the life and actually the later history of, of this museum. So that's going a little bit further than what you'd ask, but I think I answered I your initial yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah th- I, I don't really know where this question, the answer to this question will go, but I, and maybe it's a naive one. But um, given the sensitivities of the changing um, seats of power in Iran over the centuries, w- was there ever a concern or fear of somehow canonizing a previous era, you know, the Qajar era, for example, was, was there, uh, did you detect any sensitivity around that? Well, we don't want to make this regime from, from a hundred or 200 years ago look too good. Um, not at the time. Uh, I was young. I was, as I said, 25, I think. And I was very focused on the artistic and cultural achievements of that era, as I would be on any era, whether it was the Mongols or the Timurids or whatever, because I came to this with a background in Islamic art and a strong sense of the very long cultural history of Iran. But that was not true for everyone. On both sides of the equation, uh, you had descendants of the Qajar families who felt that the art had been uh, neglected Uh, during the Pahlavi era, and then you had uh, people on the other side who felt that this was a a, a sort of a period of Iranian decline, and so they did not feel that the art was of that great an interest. Um, I think we proved both of them wrong, 
the creation of a museum to celebrate this tradition is really about uh, recognizing uh, the art of, of any era. And um, also, you know, the, the creation, the actual creation of the museum, I think, was a very important statement. You know, there's a story you've told me about um, in terms of the direct involvement of Queen Farah Diba. Um, the story about how she visited right before the opening, like you guys were still vacuuming or something. Yes. <laughs> and yes. t- tell me that story. Well, I, I remember, I, I particularly remember her on the on this, you know, the museum had two floors of galleries and we were, you know, it must have been just the day or the day before the opening and, you know, we were cleaning everything up uh, and, and vacuuming the carpets. Upstairs we had carpeting and Her Majesty came and, you know, just to have a look through and I felt, you know, very much that she was really... Uh, you know, checking up on all the details, to, as she was known to do, you know, she would make sure the garbage was taken out, you know, and the windows were cleaned. And it was a great feeling of uh, that, that, uh, that we were being supported and recognized and helped uh, by having her come. But it, it certainly was a, it was a surprise. Yes. It's quite interesting that, you know, the personal interest she, that yes. she had, right? It's, it's, Absolutely. it's not a sort yeah. of, um, uh, you know, first lady starts a foundation kind of thing. It's like she's actually, you know, uh, doing her version of, of rolling up her sleeves and, you know, getting involved. Exactly. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, as you say, it's her personal involvement and attachment um, to these projects, I think, that made them happen. Her commitment, uh, as you say, it was not from, you know, high, high up uh uh, first lady of the realm, but it was literally, um, you know, and she she really, really uh, intended this for the Iranian people um, and uh, wanted us to uh, make it available and make it accessible and engage audiences. And so I think she had a very strong personal commitment and and I think she also knew her country and her citizens, you know, that things can go wrong and somebody has to come and have a last look over. <laughs> hmm. Can I ask you on a personal level, uh, Dr. Diba, what, what, what it meant to you to become, in the years after that, the first woman director of a museum in Iran? Well, it was an incredible opportunity for a young woman, which I was very conscious of at the time. Um, what is interesting is that in those five years, and I speak for myself, but for everyone involved in the arts, um, we had such opportunities uh, to study art, to get to know the collectors, to create, um, that in those five years we probably accomplished more than we would have in decades um, working in other institutions, and largely because we were given the power to do so. You know, we had the authority, we had the funds. It was a remarkable era. And so without knowing it, I actually laid the foundations for my uh, later career uh, abroad because after I left Iran, I was determined to get my PhD. I had an MA, but that was not enough. So I, I needed to get a PhD. And I began, I was offered a job at the Brooklyn Museum, but I was offered that position because they had a collection of Qajar art. And again, I found myself in, in a situation where I had a great deal of support from my mentors and superiors, and we were able to create an exhibition that was almost equivalent to, to a museum. Uh, that was the, the Qajar epoch in terms of scope and breadth. So the, those few years uh, provided we, me with immense, invaluable experience that is, is, is I cannot be duplicated. I mean... Uh you, you know, the, the, there's certainly an argument to be made that uh, Iran at the time, or still, is, is a patriarchal culture. Was did you face challenges? Did, did you know in terms? You of- know, um, actually, uh, I'm again delighted you're asking that question because I I worked in the Shabanut Secretariat uh, almost two years, and I found it to be a, a welcoming culture. Uh, there were a lot of young people. Um, there was not a sort of autocratic system, if you like. I think it was being run more like a modern institution and that we were all we were a team. And um, I, I did not face any discrimination um, of any kind, um, neither there nor when I was running the museum. 
Um, there were some people, you know, there was a certain level of, of jealousy afterwards among the uh, older wh white bearded gentlemen, as we call them, mm -hmm. that, you know, this young woman had been put in charge, but that's normal and natural. Um, but with because we had the Queen's support, um, you know, I think we were we were allowed to do our job, and certainly the atmosphere in the in her secretariat was was very the culture was very positive and um, uh, quite good for women. That's heartening to hear. That I know you didn't directly work on the Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art, but surely you were there at the time and you were part of that secretariat. Uh, tell me about the development of the, uh, the the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tehran. What what did Queen Farah want to do with that museum? Well, um, she had a double vision for that museum. One was to be a showcase for modern Iranian artists, and the other. Uh, to be the repository and um, a collection of international, modern, and contemporary art. Um, so it had a dual function. And um, I think it was part of her vision. Uh, the Negaristan and the Tomoka were complementary to each other. Because how can you have 20th century without the 19th, right? Right. And by Tomoka, you mean the Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art or Musee Honar Hoya Moasir, right? Right. And, and, and my museum, by the time uh, the revolution happened, we had about 3,000 artworks. I don't know how many were in Tomoka, but I do know approximately how many were in mine. And that's why I would claim that it was in global terms, the largest uh, collection and museum of Qajar art in the world. Um, for Tomoka, um, obviously I was very busy with my own museum. We were doing, you know, like two temporary exhibitions a year, and there was a lot of work in, in the museum. Uh, I went to the opening. Um, I was, uh, you know, it was really thrilling to, to see that museum opening, to see the carpet museum opening. Um, these these institutions, I mean, we needed all the support we could get um, because they were revolutionary in their day. Um, there was no concept in Iran. The museum was a Western product, actually, Chian. And if you think of the Golestan Museum, it really was not open to the public the way we would imagine. It was hmm. very difficult to get in. It was impossible to get into the library and see the manuscripts. And and even the few times I visited, there was not much art on view. Of course, all of that has changed. Is that but right? Museum we, started in the West? There wasn't yeah, like the a... the concept of, of a museum is a Western huh. uh, concept. What we had in Iran, which is, would, would eventually lead, I think, to the acceptance of museums, was the uh, concept of the treasury, of the chazane. And... It, this goes back as long as, you know, certainly Timurid and Safavid periods, there was always a royal treasury. And this concept is slowly expanded into the idea of a royal gallery and then royal museums. Right, um, right. So that in Iran, in the 19th century, actually, we had a, a museum in the Golestan Palace, and that was um, uh, in the uh, main entrance and reception area. But as a concept, it was a Western concept. Let, let me ask you about that opening of Tomoka or the uh, Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, because, y you know, this was considered to have the most valuable collections of modern Western masterpieces outside of Europe and North America. Uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a pretty big deal. And, and, and this was a period, I mean, I only know this through reading the history books and seeing the photos, but I mean, this was a period when folks like Salvador Dali are visiting uh, Tehran. How, how significant was this uh, on the world stage? How significant was this for Tehran, for Iran, when it opened in 1977? Again, a good question. Um, you know, no uh, really comprehensive history of uh, the museums has been written. And, and certainly uh, one of the things we were behind on in our country was um, reaching out uh, in, to international news organizations and getting coverage, uh, Jian, you know. Uh, we were barely getting to understand that. So a lot of what happened in Iran stayed in Iran. Um, the Tomoka 
uh, got the most coverage because uh, the collections were acquired from important American and European dealers and collectors, and they all came for the opening. So that was the only museum that really received, I think, uh, uh, quite a bit of coverage in the West, and the West was very much aware of you know, there was a lot of buzz about yes. all these yes. works that have been acquired, and its reputation only increased with time, uh, as opposed to my museum, which was taken over by the Revolutionary Guards in 1978, and the collections were transferred over to them and never seen again. They only began surfacing a few years ago. Uh, the Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art, except for a brief moment, stayed open through the entire revolution and post-revolutionary period in Iran. So it was the best known and I think um, the, the most covered, if you like, and, and in Europe and kept you know, the interest of the European, tremendous interest. Uh, in, in Europe and America, especially when there was, as you know, a few years ago, um, there was a trade between one painting, a de Kooning painting of the nude, oh, right, which was yeah. traded for um, the remains of the great uh, Shatamas Shaname, which were exchanged on a tarmac in Zurich. Uh, so that was happened only once. No other work has been deaccessioned. Um, from the Terra Museum or, or other museums, as far as we know, which is very good. I want yeah. to get to where, where these museums are at today or not at in the case of the Negaristan, but let me just ask you still about that period because um, these developments, the building of these museums, the openings, the glamour of it, etc., they, they were not without their detractors uh, even before the revolution. H- how did Fada Diba, how did you respond to? criticisms at the time that this was a say a a wasted use of resources in a country that had only moved from being a a developing nation a a decade or two before you know it's really strange and and maybe i was not in tune but um i i really never heard any criticisms um i think museums and art were viewed uh, more positively perhaps than the Festival of, of Shiraz, which I think drew a lot of criticism uh, because it was so avant-garde and because it took place in the middle of an urban setting. Um, whereas our museums, you know, they were in parks, they were in historic buildings, or they were new buildings in historic parks. And I think they were treated more... I Either people ignored them, because as I said, this concept of museum going didn't exist in those days the way it does today. Or, you know, they were uh, they were simply, uh, they, they were approved of by people. I, I In those four or five years, I don't recall anything negative uh, coming my way. And I, I think overall of the many aspects of modernity that, um, you know, w- were... Um, in, introduced during those two decades, museums were the most positive. And for that reason, they kept most of them open. I I did read a couple of negative articles, but funny enough, they were from uh, journalists or columnists outside of Iran saying, why, why is this money being spent, uh, et cetera, at the time, you know? Well, um, I didn't read those, but Gian, my answer to that would be, that's another example of colonialism. Uh, With all the resources we had, we, I think we had a perfect right, and it's very important to allocate funds for culture. Look, look at America today. Where, if we don't have the arts and we don't have the culture, um, where will our society be? Right. So I do think that was, again, a sort of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite sensitive to remnants of colonialism. Uh, people are even unconsciously um, using them. And I think part of that was, well, this is a Middle Eastern country with a desert and some oil, you know, uh, uh, obviously there's poverty. If, if there's poverty, you can't have museums. Well, obviously, I'm not going to agree with that. <laughs> you know, um, there's something I want you to help me work out because the, the, the revolution happens. Obviously, uh, the Negaristan Museum is shut down. The, um, the, the, the Pahlavi family are, are in exile. You have to leave and, and you know you can't come back. Uh, it's curious to me, I can't figure it out, why they would shut down, I mean, th- they being the, the 
the Khomeini regime after it consolidates the revolution, why they would shut down the Negaristan Museum, but not the Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art, which I would think would be, you know, filled Major. with a bastion yeah. of sort of uh, the evil, yes. you know, American arts and things like that. So uh, can you can you work that out for me? What what was the thinking well, around that? Yeah, I've tried to reconstruct it myself, as, as you know, because uh, I left in December 78 and the museum was occupied in February 79, and thank goodness I had a wonderful staff who stayed there, took care of the works, make sure the museum wasn't looted. Uh, I can't tell that story because I wasn't an eyewitness, but I know of it. The principal reason was the location of my museum. My museum was located at the intersection of then Koch and Sepa, and it was right next to the Senate, and it was within this large park um, where the royal residences were located. So it was literally in the same area as the Marble Palace Museum of the Reza Shah period and smaller family palaces of the Pahlavis. So what happened is I think it was just a question mainly of real estate. Uh, as I've explained in my lectures about the museum, the way I reconstructed it is there were many you know, new organizations and roving bands and, and real estate was, you know, uh, very valuable and especially this was a prime choice for real estate. And the Revolutionary Guards occupied it. I mean, they, they would not have been interested in occupying the car mu Carpet Museum of or Tomoka because of its location. But this was very convenient for them and that's the way I've reconstructed it. Another aspect is, of course, that the paintings were closely associated with monarchy and with royal authority because they were all produced for the court. And my collection had the most wonderful paintings and portraits of, of Fatali Shah and of the uh, court ladies and of the dancers. And it's it's possible that uh, they could have been offended by, by the imagery uh, because they were, as you know, at the beginning, very, very traditional, and a uh, traditional aspect of, of Islam as a religion is that it's, uh, it's uh, against imagery. Um, but uh, none of these paintings were on the wall. I had them all removed, and they were all in the basement. So I think the, the reason was primarily, as I said, uh, wanting to take over a piece of real estate. It doesn't, um, I mean, the more tragic part is uh, the inexplicable um, lack of care and sensitivity around these these works of art that has been um, expressed over the last 40 years where from what I understand even you don't even know what's where a lot of this collection is you spoke about 13 3,000 pieces of uh, 18th and 19th century Iranian art you've done a lecture called art in peril in brief obviously can, can you tell us what what is in peril and what you've discovered about where this art might be well over the last few years through research and uh, discussions with uh, colleagues and eyewitnesses I, I more or less reconstructed what happened uh, but there are huge lacunae Gian, about the early years of the revolution and about all the collections uh, that were confiscated and what happened to them. This is a very touchy and sensitive subject still, but now 20, 30 years later, people are more open to discussing it. All we know is many collections were confiscated, they were stored someplace. I believe there was like a museum of confiscated works. Um, and then at some point, slowly, uh, about 20 years later, in the 1990s, uh, the government began uh, sort of uh, using uh, this repository as a, as a source for enriching other museums. So as these other museums started putting up Qajar paintings and publishing, I was able to determine that about 30-odd of the paintings from the Nigaristan were now on view in the Saadabad Museum. And I was able to determine from eyewitnesses and friends that um, the coffeehouse painting collection might be in the Reza Abbasi Cultural Center and some of the lacquer work in the, in the Reza Abbasi Center. But this is hearsay. Nothing is documented. So it's you know such a small, small percentage of what I know was in the museum that has now 
um, be, you know, surfaced. And as I said, I, I'm encouraging uh, the current authorities to document and to be accountable uh, for what happened to the rest of the collection. And how's that going? No response so far, but I'm always an optimist. <laughs> right. Uh, what, what's the status of the Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art these days? Well, it's, you know, um, it's a, a very important museum internationally. Um, they were supposed to, uh, at least one big project a few years ago was to send works abroad to Berlin and Rome. And unfortunately, that fell through at the last minute. So there, there was a tremendous amount of interest and expectation on that museum. And the museum, you know, functions. It's, it did some interesting projects the last few years. And uh, I, I haven't heard anything recently. But as far as I know, you know, it's had different directors. Uh, but the collections are still there. There are two big catalogs of the collections, which has helped to preserve um, the integrity of the collection. Uh, two very good um, uh, large catalogs of the, both the European and Iranian collections. So I don't know what they're doing today. I think a year or two ago they did an exhibition um, associated with Parviz Tanavoli. Yes. Um, and uh, both his lion rugs and his passion for collecting. So uh, I think it's still active. What what it does not do, it, it has, and this is fascinating, Jian. It has had no acquisition funds since 1979. Um, so they have not added to the collection in all this time. So interesting. Uh, on that note, um, mm. it, it just feels like, I mean, that decade, culturally, that decade, it's, it's, it's so I ironic that the revolution happens and there's all kinds of reasons the, the revolution happens, and, and obviously some of them are, are legitimate in terms of dissent around uh, either political suppression or, or the economic issues or whatever. But culturally, that decade is so fertile, and you're on the precipice of so much happening. And I know it's a, it's a bit of a strange game to play 40 years hence, but if the revolution hadn't happened somehow, what do you think Tehran would be what Iran would mean as a hub of international arts museum and painting today? Well, it, it would have uh, become a, a cosmopolitan cultural center that we envisioned, I think, because the country economically could have continued supporting the museums. We now had, the last year, we had the structure we had the staff. Uh, there was a foundation created, uh, the Shafan Ufara Foundation. Each of the museums had its own budget, including acquisition. And the last thing I did for the museum was buy a painting at Sotheby's in London, which I was able to send back, and I saw it survived. So I, I think the museum would have continued flourishing. There were plans for more museums, Xi'an, than the ones we already had. And, and I think they, they would have flourished, frankly. Um, and, and it would have been a center for the whole Middle East, really, um, because of the government support and the depth and richness of the Persian collection. And frankly, always I say, the Iranian people's love for their own art and culture. It's a good pleasure to speak to you. It's been an education, a final question, and let's uh, end where we started. And that is... Um, about Queen Farah. Um, what, what do you believe the lasting legacy of Farah Diba is on the art and culture of Iran? Is it fair to say that Farah Diba was, was or did put Iran on the map when it came to arts and culture, or is that overstating things? No, I think she herself is always modest, but I would certainly agree with that statement. But I know she would also modify it by saying um, you know, she she had many uh, people advising and helping her. Um, and it's I think it's the legacy of her personal commitment, but as well of the devotion and commitment of her her staff and the people of Iran who helped uh, create this these wonderful institutions and help preserve the legacy. Thank you so much for this today. I really appreciate the time and the um, uh, the wisdom and uh, the reflections. 
Well, Gianna, it was really a pleasure meeting with you uh, virtually, and uh, I, I do hope uh, I enjoyed our conversation very much. It was a great opportunity for me to uh, share with you my thoughts and memories and, and to recall there's still a great deal of interest in this subject today. So thank you very much. To be continued, I feel, inevitably. Thank you. Khodafis. Khodafis. Dr. Leila Diba, an Iranian-American independent scholar, art advisor, curator, the first woman museum director in Iran back in the 1970s. Leila Diba joined us from New York City today. This is full time for the Rook series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 3, brought to you in part by Yazdani Law Group, one of Canada's largest immigration law firms, YLGPC, on Instagram. Please check out our regular editions of Rook and all things related at rookmedia.com. That's our website rookmedia.com thanks to the amazing team who make Rook Media happen producer Susan Ponta the artist the fabulous Keon Super Parisa Savvy Roham Ahai Merdod Captain Reza and Groovy Shaya thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content please subscribe if you have not done so already you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Gian Gomeshi Mizun Washington